you that September the 4th, 7 a.m. in the morning, it's a Wednesday morning, we have a first Wednesday prayer breakfast. And I would invite you all uh, to come and enjoy that service. Uh, Reverend Tom Harrison is going to be uh, conducting the service. And it's at uh, First United in St. John. Uh, so I'd like to remind you that I also want to draw your attention to the little yellow piece inside your bulletin, taking it to the streets. I invite you to a training of disciple making and outreach. Uh, this week just finished, we uh, united the three conferences into the Great Plains Conference. Kansas West, that's us, Kansas East, and Nebraska. And uh, we had a tremendous few days over there. Uh, I was intended to go on and planned for it to go on on Saturday, but it went so well it finished till on uh, Friday night, about 9 o'clock. So uh, we didn't have to do Saturday session. But right now we're at the Great, well, as of January 1, at the Great Plains Conference. But it's all been voted on, and agreed to, and, uh, so all is well. Now I also wanted to uh, mention that we have some of the smartest kids in the world. Uh, this is the Stafford County Fair, and I uh, highlighted some of our own kids. Bionship and Style Review, Champion Taylor Clark, Champion Senior Age Division, Rianne Collins, Reserve Champion, Rianne Collins, Overall Champion, Rianne Collins, Clothing Construction, Champion Taylor Clark, Construction Style Review, Reserve Champion, Dylan Reed, Dylan is there. Yes. Yeah, Dylan is there. Intermediate Age Division Champion Taylor Clark. Reserve Champion Jayden. Wow. Smart kids. Overall Reserve Grand Champion Taylor Clark. Electronics Champion Taylor Clark. Food and Nutrition Champion Dylan Reed. Reserve Champion Jayden. These are all our kids. And I'm sure there are others, but I don't recognize their name. Photography champion, Rian Collins. Senior reserve champion, Rian Collins. Uh, then, intermediate age division, notebooks, posters, and education displays. Champion, Taylor Park. Grand, overall grand champion, Taylor Park. Citizenship notebook. I don't know if you know it, but Taylor is writing uh, the history of the uh, graveyard. It's just to the right, my right, your left, on uh, Highway 50. Uh, Martin, uh, she's done a fantastic job of riding the Martin family uh, very well. By the way, anyway, that's some of our kids. And now, you're, I see them, uh, that is in here this morning, but we uh, always keep her in our prayers. I guess they're away. They're locked. So let's keep them in our prayers as well. All right. Krishna called this morning, and they were just ready to head to Illinois. Chelsea. Let's let's keep Chelsea in our prayers and. Um, you know, I've been in seminary, and it's nice to get ten dollars, five dollars. Uh, it's nice to get a reminder from the folks in your old church uh, every so often. Amazing how far five dollars goes. Doesn't have to be a lot; just a little card thinking of you, praying for you. Here's a little note for you. Uh, so let's keep. Uh, uh, her and Tyler, Chelsea and Tyler, in our prayers. Of course, there's Emma in uh, Columbia. In Ecuador, yeah, Let's keep her in our prayers. We need to 
cover them with good prayer. Okay, do we have a uh, piece today from the weekend? No kids today. I'm just having Jane to play something for us. Turn to him number four 
use even me. Just as thou wilt, when and where, until thy blessed face I see, thy rest, thy joy, thy glory share. Mind me without a hymn, take my life, and let it be a consecrated Lord to thee. Well, let us uh, turn in our Bibles, and we're going to turn, first of all, to the New Testament. We're going to turn to Luke, chapter 13. Luke, chapter 13, found on page uh, 75 of the New Bible. 74, verses 10 through 17. Luke. 13, 10 through 17. Is Jesus doing a good work when the work is needed to be done? Listen to the word of God. Luke, 10, Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are free from your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her. And immediately she was made straight and she praised God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered them, You hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead him away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all of his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. I want you to see how clever Jesus is. They could loose their ox or their ass, their donkeys, loose, untie them, and take them for water. Why can't we untie children of Abraham and made them to eternal life. See the connection? Uh, let us now turn to the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And it's found on page 661 in your pew Bibles, the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. And I want you to uh, listen to the words as it comes to you from chapter 1. Verses 4 through 10. I'm going to read verse 1 as well. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, is found on page 661 of the Pew Bible. Listen to the word of God. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. As God knew Jeremiah from conception, even before that. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Oh, Lord God, Behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to 
break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Imagine now the Lord sending a pastor to this church or any other church to pluck up, destroy and rebuild. Well, I want to talk to you today about reluctant leaders. Reluctant leaders. And, um, really, I can point at you and say you're reluctant leaders, but then there are uh, three fingers pointing back at this reluctant leader. We just read the story, the beginning of the prophet Jeremiah, whom he was, the son of whom, and God called him into the ministry, the prophetic ministry. And we know from history that the prophet Jeremiah ministered and prophesied between the years 627 and 586 B.C. Well, time stopped when Jesus came and then started over again 2,000 years ago. And before that, we come from his time of birth backwards. So 627 to 528, well, that's 600 years before Jesus Christ was born. Jeremiah was called by the Lord, Jesus Christ, to prophesy to the people. And Jeremiah prophesied over the last five kings of Judah. You know that uh, Judah was overthrown in, uh, until 1948. Uh, Judah was ruled by other forces. So the last five kings of Judah were the, the time that Jeremiah was prophesying. Those kings were Josiah, Josiah, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Well, uh, in the year 586 B.C., Babylon, uh, today we call Babylon Iraq, Iraq invaded and conquered Judah. Now, someone uh, recently in our lifetime, in the lifetime of most of us here, decided he was going to rebuild Babylon, make it the great empire it was. Uh, he ended up at the end of a rope, and his name was Saddam Hussein. He was putting great effort into rebuilding Babylon. Well, the book of Jeremiah was written by the prophet himself. Uh, he kept a diary, and it became scripture, the word of God. It gives his genealogy, whom he was, the fact that he was called like so many other people. And this call came to him at a very tender age. He was just a youth. And he responded and accepted that call as a prophet, unmistakable, and was more unsolicited. Well, I really admire Jeremiah because I can think of one other person who was given the call early in life, and he decided to, uh, you now he was going to shake it off. And uh, he was not going to uh, do what the Lord said, but. After a while, the Lord just tightened the noose until uh, this guy had to give in at a very late age and sort of wasted, absolutely wasted the early part of his life. It would have been so much better if he had responded. I never thought I was capable, I never thought I could do it, I wasn't good enough, and you know, the same thing Moses said. Moses was there on the backside of the desert for 40 years, and he thought, well, you know, I'll just be a shepherd and die. The Lord put a fire out there, just like this candle. And Moses said, what is that? Why would it be consumed? Uh, he received his call. God knew what would get his attention. God knew what would get my attention. Well, yeah, we had anointed and appointed Jeremiah, the boy prophet. During the reign of the boy King Josiah. So the old 
folks were not cutting it. They were, they were doing it. They were doing the job. So here was this young boy. God appointed him as king, just shy. It's a boy. Who are you? The Lord said, well, you know, we got a boy king. Let me appoint a boy prophet. And he called Jeremiah. Two young boys leading the nation of Israel. And all the old folks were there sort of throwing stones at him. If God offered you a job today, would you take it? Would you do like me? Would you do like Jeremiah? Would you say, no, Lord, I'm not good enough. I got it. No, I can't handle it. I can't read your people. Would you turn it down? The question is, where is your sense of call? Where's your discernment? And you heard us use discernment in one of the hymns we just said. You see, God speaks to us, and God speaks through us, and we are empowered to transform the world into an unshakable realm of love and justice. Are we equipped for leadership? Yes. I mean, that's the crux of the sermon. Are we leaders? Yes. You're called by Jesus Christ? Yes, you're a leader. Are we anointed and appointed by Jesus Christ? Yes, we are. Some folks seem to think that you were born as a leader. Others uh, reluctantly come along and they study leadership. They go, to, uh, they go to college, they go to seminary, and they learn the skills. And some people have natural charisma. And when they come into a room, you know, they like the room. And people gravitate. As, list, as leaders, Christian leaders are, some of us, like Jeremiah, just puny, puny little guy. God said to the boy, Jeremiah, do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. Jeremiah 1, 7 and 8. You see, it's God who equips us. It's God who sends us. It's God who anoints us. It's God who made us. God who knows us. God who knows us even before conception. God said to Jeremiah, even before you were conceived, I knew you. When you were a child, I called you even before you were in the womb. And it is God who sends us out, the God who equips us. So what is there to fear? As Christians, we should know that God has a plan. Now, God could just go around knocking everybody in the head. You be a Christian, you be a Christian, you be a Christian. And, you know, we believe, but God has another plan. He says, I'm going to call you. Those of you sitting in church this morning, and I'm going to send you out into the world. I'm going to give you my word. He touched Jeremiah's tongue and said, I'm putting my words into your mouth. And he sent Jeremiah out. He knew Jeremiah would face a lot of opposition. Just as we go out there, we're going to face a lot of opposition. Uh, I just ran into a nice, tall, handsome young man, and I said, now, which church do you go to? And he, he was, uh, don't give me that. I don't want to hear it, but you hypocrites. Um, you know, you're going to get that. You're going to get a lot of that. But it shouldn't stop you. It shouldn't put you off. When you meet someone who's not in church, when you meet someone who is not saved, obviously not saved in your minds, my, uh, in our understanding, in our perception of what it takes to be a saved person, say to God, before I speak to this person, give me the words to be able to tell them about Jesus. Some of us are so embarrassed to mention the name Jesus Christ. And he now they're mentioning the name all the time. Every time they stop their toe, he, Jesus Christ. You know, they, they use the words more than we do. And we're the ones who are supposed to tell the world about Jesus Christ. Now here's this boy, minding his own little business, probably going to be a farmer like 
dad or whatever dad was, and God comes to him and he's looking for a job. He didn't want a job. God came and anointed him and said, you got a job. Moses was the same thing. He didn't want to, he didn't want to lead other people out of Israel. He was just happy to take care of sheep on the mountainside. And God said, you got a job. You're going to lead the people. Isaiah wasn't looking for a job. God gave him a vision of God's holiness. God anointed and appointed Jeremiah to be a prophet. And God has a plan for you and for me. It's the same plan. Go tell the world. Go tell the world. Go tell the world. Go tell the world about Jesus Christ. So God has a plan. God's pretty smart. God has enabling power. He's not going to send you out there on your own. Jesus Christ is with you now and forever, even to the end of the age. Jeremiah, like all of us who are called to God's army, had the same reaction. Who, me? Why me? I'm just a boy. Hey, why me? I'm just a... Hey, God, you put your own... Whatever you're just a in there. I'm just a... You know, who, me? Why me, God? Well, whom God calls, God first equips. Whom God calls, God first enables. God wants to use us to bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, when we get to heaven, for those of us who have received Jesus Christ by faith, we want to be able to look around and say, look, you see all these people here, Lord? I was the one who spoke to them, and the Holy Spirit was the one who convicted them. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't really want to convict anyone until you have spoken to them the word of God. And I know it's so hard, you know, we work in this world where separation of church and state and until it suits everybody to use that separation of church and state for their own purposes. And it's hard for us to uh, be able to select. I mean, we, we're working in the workplace with somebody who is cussing like a sailor. And, you know, we need to bring him to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Jeremiah was only a youth, not an experienced Christian. You know, most people in church say, well, uh, let the pastor handle that. Well, is it easier for, say, 50 people in church to get one person each, bring 50 new people, or is it easier for the pastor to go out and speak in an area he's not familiar with, people he didn't know before, and bring 50 new people in? It's easier if each one brings just one. Each one of us just brings one. That would save the past of having to go on and bring fifth. All right. See, God said, it's not about you, it's about me. It's not you that, that, that's important, it's God is important. I will put my words into your mouth, I am with you. God is always with us wherever we are. You know, the disciples found that out. They were in a boat and was, they were about to be drowned. The boat was about to capsize. And the boat was taken in water and they were about to go down and there was Jesus snoring away at the bottom of the boat. You know. And, Master, don't you care about us? Yes, I do. Peace, be still. And the storms were quiet. Of course he does. But he wants us to know that when we're in the boat, in the storm, he's in the boat with us in the storm. So I want you to know today that God has a plan, first of all, and God has an enabling power. God can do it through us. And then God has the power to use our services, God will. That's God's will. None should perish. God wants to use us. And we each have been granted gifts from God. Every person who's come to Jesus Christ by faith has been granted the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
There's nothing higher on earth than the gift of the Holy Spirit. Take a little boy who uh, went to a rally, you know, he was there, and there were 5,000 men, and there were probably 10,000 women, 15,000 women, and you know, there are two or three times the number of women as there are men in church. And then uh, there were all the kids, and he said, well, I got his two fish and five loaves. What's that to him? all these thousands of people? Jesus said, give it to me. Give it to Jesus, you put it in his hands, and two fish and five loaves can feed 20 or 30,000 people. I'm never amazed, I'm not always amazed that I go to a church function and you look at all these people here and potluck or whatever it is, and you think, look at the little bit of food there, boy, I wonder if it's going to feed everybody. And then we say grace, and then there's food left over carry home what's left. You know, everybody brings a dish and all these people here and half the dish is used and the other half we take home. Just like the one time when the boy gave two fish and five loaves, they picked up another twelve baskets, one for each disciple. So we each have talents, we each have gifts. I'm just a puny little boy. No, you're not. You're not a puny little girl. You're a child of God. Someone once said, 90% of Christians have never invited anyone else to church. 90% of Christians have never told anyone about Jesus Christ. They've never told anyone, look what he's done for me. Look how Jesus Christ has blessed me. Imagine going to school or going to the bank or somewhere and telling the workers there, well, look how God has blessed me. Yeah, you don't do that kind of thing in our society. But you know, they ought to know why you're so blessed. I remember we were, uh, Dorothy and I were working in a place and God has so blessed us and that's not, nothing I did or nothing I could have afforded. But God put all four of our sons through the, one of the finest high schools, junior high, senior high, in the world. It was run by Benedictine Mounts. I mean, the cost in those days was astronomical. And all the other kids who were there, uh, their fathers were judges and lawyers and doctors and surgeons and all of these other things, and there were the Simon kids. And every year they graduated, just about 40 kids, entire schools, 40 kids was what they were shooting for. There was always this one little black kid in, in the group, and uh, he graduated the same way the other 39 or 40 kids graduated. Their parents just uh, wrote a check every semester and sent it in. Uh, we relied on the monks to, uh, to help us. The monks helped us because God helped them and they helped us. Well, suppose you had the cure for some disease. Let's pick on one, whatever it is, AIDS or something. And you saw somebody dying of AIDS, and you said, well, die on son, die on person. Would you do that, or would you say, well, look, you're dying of AIDS. I've got this cure. Here it is. Take this cure and live. We're all sinners. But those of us in the church, we're saved by grace. I'm sure if you had the cure for AIDS and you saw somebody dying of AIDS, you would give them that portion, whatever it is. You know, sinners will think that's 100% certainty. We're all going to die. We're all going to leave this world. We're all going to go on to the world to come because of sin. We need to help others just as God has helped us to choose the good ending, the good life beyond life in heaven with Jesus Christ. 
We ought to bring others into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ so that they too would be able to go to heaven with us. And when we look around in heaven, we can see all these people and say, Lord, you know, I was able, thanks to you, you're equipped, you're anointed, you're appointed. I was able to bring all these people with me in heaven. That's the only thing you can take to heaven. Can't take your money. Can't take your nice car. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with nice cars. Can't take your nice home. Nothing wrong with nice home. God wants us to have all of those things. God wants us to have nice farms, nice jobs. God wants us to be of service to God and to the people and the community around us. God has prepared us for that. He said, love God and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. My friends, you have the key to eternal life in your hand. All of us have this terminal disease called sin. We're going to spend all of eternity in one place or the other. There's no alternative. You want to go to heaven or you go to hell? And we make that decision for ourselves. <coughs> and those others out there will make that decision if we try to help them to make the right decision to come to Jesus Christ. We've been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we are now citizens of heaven. We have eternal life. Let us pass it on to others. And we can because God has richly blessed us. God has equipped us. God has, God has this plan and God has this enabling power. And God has the power to use our service as God will. Let us not be reluctant believers. Let us now stand and repeat him. 883. 883. 883. And that's with our Canadian friends. 883. And together, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God. Who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, who reconciled and made me new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus. Crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Praise be to God. Amen. There's a sermon. We are not alone. Praise be to God. Amen. Uh, please uh, turn to our bulletins and let us repeat our prayer of thanksgiving. We have been called to speak and to live Christ's love in the world. We do so by offering all that we have, all that we are, and all that we do, trusting that God will use these gifts to bring the unshakable realm of love and justice to our world. We offer our Receive 
with me, you continue to worship. In three, four, seven. In three, four, seven.